Welcome everybody to this week's uh, monthly webinar with me, Michael Hewson, and my colleague in Toronto, Colin Szynski. Um, quite a bit to get through today. Um, obviously, commodities are uh, one case in point, and it's certainly something that we will be looking at, both myself and Colin. The commodity currencies as well, and potential for further easing measures, maybe from the Bank of Canada, the RBA, and um, potentially the RBNZ. Also going to be looking at um, U.S. earnings. Um, and whether or not there's going to be any seasonal variations. We're going to look at potentially the, um, the strength of the dollar as well and um, try and determine whether or not that could well have an effect going forward on S&P 500 tech earnings and earnings in general. For now, um, let's go and just basically work our way through the various disclaimers, which uh, we have to basically put up um, to keep our good compliance department all happy and sweet and fine and, and dandy and what have you. And then we can basically then crack on. So and I know you've got quite a bit that you want to say about commodities, Colin, but um, before, before we do, um, for those of you who don't know, I know um, Daniel or Danny, um, you basically commented on the color of my tie earlier this week when you viewed my gold video. So we're going to start. We're going to start with gold because we've heard an awful lot of um, speculation, I think is probably the best word that I can use, with respect to the reasons why we got the sudden sell-off in gold um, over the weekend from uh, nervousness about a U.S. rate hike. I mean, come on, give me a break. That's not exactly new. So I don't think that was behind the move lower in gold prices, but I certainly think Given what we know with respect to the strength of the dollar, the fact that gold is moving lower really shouldn't be a surprise if you look at this chart. It's been trending lower for quite some time. So we can see straight away the 2014 lows, 1,130. If you're going to be long a gold, where are you going to put your stop? You're going to put it underneath there. So any break underneath there is going to trigger a reaction, and that's what we got. Now, what the catalyst was, I think there's probably any number of catalysts, one of which it has been speculated that um, the Chinese admission that uh, their gold reserves were potentially lower than what markets had initially suspected they were could have been behind that. I'm a little bit skeptical about that, and I think that I think you know if you believe everything that Chinese authorities tell you, then I think you're being somewhat naive. Um, the Chinese will tell you what they want you to know, not necessarily what is actually true. And I think if you're looking to buy gold and build up your gold reserves, what better way to do that than manipulate the gold price lower? That's my theory anyway, conspiracy theory and all of that. But uh, be there that was another it, round of thinking on that, that, uh, go on. that it could also be that people had just outright stolen it. <laughs> There's all kinds of that. That perhaps uh, that, uh, that that if, if perhaps the memory is real, and if that if that's true, then then perhaps it might be indicative of how much has been squirreled away by uh, by various officials. That's a whole other, that was another line of uh, of thinking I'd seen earlier in the week. So there's certainly lots of speculation, but there's certainly I think the the bottom line on that one is that we do, as Michael said, we do have to take any any official numbers with a grain of salt. So, Big one. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, basically what we're looking at now, the key level for me on the gold price is, let's start with this chart here. Now, I'm not being rude in the bottom left-hand corner. Brown's bottom. Why is that Brown's bottom? Because that's where our esteemed Chancellor, Gordon Brown, sold um, quite a bit of the UK's bullion reserves in 2001-2002, right at the bottom of the market. And... If we can then do some nice little Fibonacci retracement levels off that, pretty brings us in at around about, give or take, 1088, give or take, uh, give or take the odd, give or take the odd dollar or two, but around 1088 is 50% retracement of the entire up move from $250 an ounce to the highs at 1921. So in that context, these, this move um, lower needs to push below the 1085 level. Um, and you can, you can look at it in, in 
a more in-depth analysis of that in my weekly video that I posted on YouTube, which um, one of you was so kindly um, commented on the colour of my tie. Well, I thought it was topical. Gold tie, talking about gold, why not? So 1088, that's our next level. But also we've got the 2010 lows at 1044. So while people are basically saying that we could well see further losses, I certainly don't rule it out, but what we need to do is we need to stay below this breakout level at 1130. 1135 is really the level that I'm looking at for us to stay below, for us to push down through 1085 towards 1044. Now this, this move lower in gold, it's not just unique to gold. We've seen declines pretty much across the board. Um, I'm finished with this gold chart, Colin, unless there's anything else you want to add. Uh, I just wanted to comment on a couple of things here with gold, Michael, before we okay. move on. Right, and and just... so we've seen this, as Michael knows, I think the, the catalyst between the, the Chinese and also the technical break of those lows were what caused, caused the uh, the big $50 drop we had in gold on Monday. But there's still a lot of... Uh, a lot of storms swirling around gold. In, in particular, the uh, we've seen capital in general starting to come back out of some of the defensive havens, not just gold, but also the yen, and uh, and also the uh, the fact that inflation pressures are coming off, which we're going to see in a moment. But one thing I wanted to highlight on the stochastics is we are getting a little bit of a positive divergence, and we are starting to get some oversold readings on stochastics and RSI. So it is possible we might get a pause here. And we're also starting to get uh, a little bit closer to a, a more seasonally favorable period for gold in terms of uh, short-term trading. Uh, Indian wedding season comes up in the fall, and historically, August and September have been okay months for gold. October. Diwali. is a little more mixed with Dewal exactly. So we have um, we are getting to a point where we could be getting close to a seasonal washout uh, in gold with the potential for a, a pause or a bounce. But uh, I'm still thinking that there's a uh, there's a possibility we could still see a uh, a bit more downside, perhaps to that 1040 or even. I mean, we're so close to uh, striking distance of the thousand round number. I still I'm sitting here questioning myself if we're going to uh, probe that before before we get the seasonal bounce or or during the or after or sometime later on. It's uh, it's, it's I'm still a little up in the air on that one. There's still another factor to price in there, Colin. You have to recall that the previous high in gold was what? It's 1040, 1050. Mm, yeah. Which also corresponds with the 2010 lows. You know, and first of all, a technical analysis is support and resistance can reverse their roles. One oh, yes, the, absolutely. One of, one of the key roles. So the previous high in gold was just above a, was just above $1,000 an ounce in 1980. Mm -hmm. So um, it stands so we to could reason retest that again. we could retest that again. So even if we break below 1080, we yeah. could get a washout to around about 1040, 1050, and then a rebound. So everyone's so negative on gold, and certainly I think there's an awful lot of reasons to be negative on gold. But do I think we get a Fed rate hike in September? No, I don't. Um, I think it's too soon. I think despite those weekly jobless claims numbers that we saw earlier today, which came in at the lowest levels since 1973, there are still significant concerns about the U.S. economy, particularly in the manufacturing sector, which appears to be in recession after those revisions, those downward revisions to industrial production data earlier this week, as well as the poor retail sales numbers that we've been seeing out of the U.S. over the course of of the past few months as well. So even though the jobs market looks pretty healthy, low participation rate notwithstanding, um, inflation appears to be fairly benign and likely to remain so, and that's basically feeding into what we're going to talk about next. Not only are gold prices coming off, but a whole commodity space is coming off as well. Oil prices, gas prices, sugar prices, copper prices, grain prices. So. All of that means that in terms of raw materials, food and everything else, there is no real price inflation at the moment. You know, milk prices as well um, are under pressure. So that's going to keep pricing pressures, I think, fairly muted over the course of the next few months. So let's move on to crude give you a similar sort of story. You know, I know you wanted to talk about the dollar index, 
we'll talk about that, didn't you, Colin? We'll talk about that in the, in the context of the stronger dollar later. But certainly in the context of Brent and WTI, the direction of travel here seems pretty clear. Lower highs, lower lows. The next target for me is this $54 a barrel level lows here. We've had a bit of a rebound. The direction of travel still remains lower. And the likelihood is, given the Iran deal, whether or not you believe it's viable, the fact of the matter is the fundamentals and the price action do seem to suggest that further, further declines in oil prices seem pretty much nailed on. And certainly I think the currency price actions also speak to that as well, particularly dollar CAD. Yeah, can I speak a little bit to oil before we move on to that? Sure. Is that uh, on top of Iran coming back into the market, the, the, the supply war isn't going away anytime soon either. The, uh, the, the Saudis have been running around for the last several months clucking about how they've won. But uh, in, in fact, I, I think the, the, the talk out of the U.S. has been uh, lately that now that they've cut back on, on their exploration, now they're looking to cut back their costs and get the production going. And, and one thing that's been, uh, been making the rounds in the last few weeks was the idea of going back and refracking some of these old shale wells to see if they can get more oil out of them at a really low cost. So I think we're going to hit a point where the, uh, the U.S. producers, uh, their initial response was to cut exploration. Their next response is going to be to cut costs and get their, uh, their production back up because they, they've certainly been, uh, people have been, been, they don't want to be seen as the big losers in all of this. And, uh, and uh, they're going to find a way to uh, eventually to, uh, to respond to the, the challenge from the Saudis. So th this, could, uh, this could drag on for a while. We've got uh, WTI has gone back under 50 bucks. Uh, I see no reason why, and it's starting to take out, you'll see on, on the chart Michael's put up, that 62% retracement. If that doesn't start to hold soon, then you're looking at a full round trip, which, and you could, uh, you could retest those March lows, and it wouldn't surprise me in the, uh, in the coming months to see that happen. So basically what we need to see here is a move back above really $50, an ounce, uh, $50 a barrel yeah. um, to suggest that you know, there's a potential base in place. But certainly in the context of that particular chart, you know, Colin's right. I think, we could be, I think we could be building up for a bit of a round trip back to the lows that we saw in March. And certainly if you then think it all the way out and you look at where crude prices, U.S. crude prices were in June last year and where they are now, you know, I mean, you look at you look at the annualised inflation effect with respect to that, um, and you wonder, and then and then you wonder why um, U.S. CPI is as benign as it is, and yet, despite this, there doesn't appear to have been any sort of consumer-led rebound in terms of consumption spending or anything like that with respect to the U.S. economy, which does make me wonder as to how confident U.S. consumers. Ah. Well, on that, could you bring up the gasoline price, Michael? Because uh, uh, there's a point I wanted to make to that. And, and actually, it ties back into earnings as well. Okay. I don't think I've actually got it. Let me find it. Okay, so while Michael's getting the chart, uh, something that I noticed this morning in the, in the earnings was that the best earnings out of the states this morning was out of Dow Chemical, and uh, they just totally blew away street estimates. And last quarter, all the refiners totally blew away street estimates. And, and one of the reasons I think why you're not seeing, now you are seeing, seeing a kick in a little bit here, but uh, but look at this chart in, the, in gasoline. While crude oil bottomed out in March, through the winter, gasoline prices actually had recovered first. And something that's happened and we're seeing in earnings is that refining margins have exploded, uh, positively exploded, and, and the refiners are making a boatload of money. So they're, anybody who's got a uh, raw material cost in crude oil, uh, they're doing just great because the, the raw material costs are going down a lot faster than the refined product costs. So the, uh, the, the, the point of this being is that the, uh, the fall in the crude oil price isn't showing up at the pump price, and the refiners are making an absolute fortune, and the chemical companies are making an absolute fortune. Money hand over fist these days. And that's possibly one of the reasons why we're not seeing it translate into consumer spending is because the money hasn't found its way back into people's pockets. So what we'll be watching here with gasoline in the next uh, couple of months is uh, is we're, we're we're right through running right through we're about halfway through the middle of uh, of summer driving season. So what happens when uh, when that comes off as we uh, as we head into the fall? And uh, at some point, do we see these uh, these refining margins get uh, get shrunk, or are they going to stay uh, blown wide open like they are? these days. We'll see what uh, what happens there. But with crude oil coming down, you would think gasoline could be uh, could be quite vulnerable here. 
Well, Maybe we could we'll... overlay the uh, overlay the WTI on top of that, Michael. Is that possible? Yeah, I think we could. Of course, it's possible. Yes, I know it's possible. I'm sorry. <laughs> I meant if you don't mind. <laughs> cool, cool, mate. Let me just uh, try and drag that on. And you'll see what go. I mean. It's quite a. Uh, Let's get rid of that and change that. There. So if you look back in the fall, November, December, they were basically tracking each other, and then since then that spread, which um, okay. the, the spread there between oil and gasoline has blown wide open. In um, gasoline's favour. Yes. So either so, that's going to close, or or what? It'll be we'll be watching to see that over the next little while, particularly with crude coming down again. Well, I mean, if it's anything like um, here in the UK, the politicians are going to go to the. Uh, um, petrol companies are going to say, why aren't you passing these price cuts on to the consumers? Because it's fair. You know, basically we've had, while prices were dropping off here, gasoline prices were still going up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think it does beg the question why US companies aren't passing that on. But obviously that's, that's gasoline, that's WTI. We've had similar sorts of declines also in copper prices. We can see that here. Mm -hmm. um, made new multi-year lows on copper right there direction of travel is fairly clear but not just that let's look at sugar as well um, you know that's looking pretty soft um, also if we look at corn you know sort of food staples you just blow that out, we've had a little bit of a spike there. But look at where we are in context of 2014. Again, we're quite a bit lower. So you know, all across the commodity space, we've seen commodities come under pressure. And that has consequences for currencies like the Canadian dollar. And this is where I'm sure you'll want to jump in. Uh, absolutely. So the Canadian dollar uh, totally broke out uh, earlier this month, clearing the 128 level. It's driven pretty much straight up to 130, where it's uh, it started to level off in the last day or so. And as we can see, that's back getting close to the 2008 highs as well. There was a measured objective up to about 132, but so far the resistance kicking in in and around 130. And uh, certainly, though, we can see uh, that, uh, and we're seeing, starting to see a bit there, but it's bumping up against it. There's no really a sign of a top. We are getting overbought on, as we can see on the stochastics, it's also showing same on the RSI, but we're not seeing any indications yet of a, of a top forming. We haven't seen that roll back down. We haven't seen a negative divergence. So at this point, it looks like we're just pausing a bit around 130, but, uh, but overall, that's, uh, there's still quite a bit of weakness. The, the Bank of Canada cut interest rates last week. There's a lot of talk that they may have to cut it gain and uh, at a time when interest and, and people talking about the divergence here of the the expectation that the Fed's going to raise interest rates sometime this year versus that the Bank of Canada may have to cut again they've already cut twice has that uh, is what's totally driven that uh, that uh, the dollar uh, the loony much uh, yeah, I mean, lower and dollar cat higher over the last few months. Now, if uh, if Michael's right and the U.S. doesn't raise interest rates, then that side of the equation changes, and uh, and then perhaps this might be it might be getting close to a top. That's the thing you see, and I think in terms of you know trading this particular market, if you're looking to go long dollar cat, I wouldn't be looking to go long here, um, simply because we are so close. If you look yeah. at the number of times we tested this 130, 65, 70 level in 2008 and 2009, on four separate months, we tested it and failed to get above it. So it's important. And if you're looking, you know, sort of, if you're looking to place a low-risk trade, then your stop really needs to be at 131 um, for, you know, a move back down towards these previous 2015 peaks, which we saw um, in February and March, at around about uh, 128, 128, 10, 128, 20. So certainly, I think it's going to be very interesting to see how the CAD reacts around 130, 70, 130, 80.
Yes, and on top of that, we can. I also just may add something else on the U.S. dollar here. Regardless of whether the U.S. raises interest rates this fall or not, it's priced in now. And when we, when you, if you think that the uh, the U.S. has put up their their lowest jobless claims in 40 years, and U.S. dollar didn't go up anymore, that 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 says to me that that the uh, the September liftoff, one to two hikes, has already been priced into the market, and and therefore, what would it take to push the U.S. dollar higher? The U.S. dollar may now have actually Actually reached its high point against a number of these other currencies unless they actually deliver and start to accelerate uh, interest rate increases even even faster than what the streets are already expecting so I think I think that's been baked in and that's starting to get baked into currencies because when you see a market a market that's going up that fails to respond to good news usually means it's already been priced in and and on that basis then the uh, the balance of probabilities the the surprise is now actually starting to swing back the uh, swing back the other way where if they did actually even if they did start raising interest rates the US dollar may not go up anymore because it's already been baked in yeah indeed and if you look at the dollar index which is what we're looking at at the moment look how far it's gone up in the past 12 months um you know we we're talking 20% or so or more and that is going to have an effect not only on inflation, but also on earnings for U.S. companies. Absolutely, and, and we're seeing that this week. Why don't we go with that, Michael? Yeah, go on and you go. Okay, so we've started to see this show up, and, and in particularly where, where we're really seeing it is in the technology sector, and that's been something that's been building over the last couple of quarters, but in particular it explains why the action we saw earlier this week where we had uh, both Apple and Microsoft beat the street on headline earnings, and yet their stocks posts sold off. So maybe you want to pick up there because I know you had some great comments on Apple in particular. Well, Apple in particular was particularly interesting, I think, because of the fact that even though we we sort of met, met expectations on earnings. What was actually quite interesting from once you once you dig around into the internals was um, the actual the level of sales in China, for example, which was 21% lower over the course of you know the last quarter. Now that for me I think is quite important because I think China is one of Apple's is going to be in one of Apple's biggest markets. And the fact that despite the I think despite the fact that we saw you know fairly good revenues out of China, the fact that sales were down twenty one percent suggests to me that the sell off that we saw in the Chinese equity market is starting to hit the Chinese middle class. Mm -hmm. Now obviously Apple products aren't cheap. They're not what you would call um products for people people lower down the income scale. So in that context I think there is a little bit of concern that Apple's exposure to China as a new market could see an earnings impact going forward. And I think, yes, we have seen a bit of a rebound in the context of yesterday's declines. But overall, with Apple, we're in a trading range above the 200-day moving average. There's a, bit of a, there's a bit of a reversal there, and I think we'll continue to trade within that range. And if you look at Apple's earnings, forward earnings, it's around about 15. So I'm not overly concerned about Apple. It still generates 50, 40 to $50 billion a quarter in terms of revenues. But some of the other company earnings that we've been seeing from companies, say, for example, like Netflix, Let's look at Netflix and let's see. Let's compare Netflix to, say, for example, Apple. Um, just going to go back to Apple again and look at Apple's performance this year. Hasn't really done an awful lot. Um, yeah, I would suggest it's you know it's one of those companies. It's 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 a company that is very very popular. It's iconic. It has some very very good brands. And then we've got a company Apple like. Sure, looks a lot like the Dow and the S and P too. Well, it's not really surprising when you actually consider how big the company is. Exactly. Um, and then let's look at let's look at Netflix. That's look since the beginning that. of that's since the beginning of the year. That that stock price has trebled. It's gone from forty dollars to nearly one hundred and twenty dollars. Okay. So you compare a company like Netflix, which obviously is a very very growth sensitive stock. It require it relies on subscriptions and what have you, it trades on forward earnings of, compared to Apple, which is 15, Netflix trades on forward earnings of 475. Wow, that's huge. So, 
So that's crazy. That's bubble days. That's bubble that, valuation. That is a bubble valuation. But, you know, you can inflate a bubble for quite some time before it goes pop. But yeah. would, I, would I buy Netflix? Not in a million years. Not even if it was half the price that it is now. Not on that valuation. So when I and look at... At the same time, it's a hard one to short because you're standing in front of a freight train. Exactly. Exactly. And, but the thing is, there's a dirty great big gap between 100 and 108. And gaps generally tend to get filled. So we'll see how that pans out. But let's, let's take us back to a chart that I also showed earlier this week. And that was, as the S&P, as you say, pretty, pretty similar to, um, pretty similar to um, Apple's stock price. But now let's go and look at the Dow. Again, not much difference there. Now let's look at the small cap. Now let's look at the NASDAQ. Okay. Now let's look at the correlation here since the beginning of the year. Okay. So for me, this is a bit of a warning sign for U.S. stocks, and this is something that I talked about on Bloomberg earlier this week. We've got record highs between April and May um, for all of the major indexes, and then suddenly here the NASDAQ in red spikes higher. What's interesting is the small cap continues to track lower. The S&P trades sideways, but the Dow also starts to track lower. Now, if you've got markets that are closely correlated or going in the same direction, I generally don't have a problem with thinking of the markets going up. When one particular market basically goes higher, but the others don't track it, particularly the US small cap 2000, that makes me a little bit concerned that there's a huge amount of divergence going on and there's an awful lot of uncertainty with respect to where US stocks are going to go next. And when you see valuations of 400 times earnings, you really have to question whether or not there is much more upside in U.S. stocks. It's more risky. And particularly when you're looking at something like the NASDAQ taking off like that when the, uh, when the broader markets aren't because it's usually a uh, – that in the past has been a, been a sign of a because the Nasdaq's only 100 stocks and it's 100, 100 tech stocks, well tech and, and a few other things, mm. but uh, a lot of momentum plays in there that you got to wonder sometimes if speculation's gotten a little bit out of hand when you start seeing stuff like that. Absolutely. So that's I mean that's the earnings story and you know we saw yesterday's sell-off come off the back of some disappointment from Microsoft, disappointment from Intel. Disappointment from IBM, disappointment from Yahoo, and a little bit of a negative reaction to Apple. And I think it was interesting that Tim Cook said that they were operating in a difficult foreign exchange environment, which is code, I think, for we're worried about the strength of the dollar. Mm -hmm. so well, I mean, it's up 20% over a year is going to impact your business of the multinationals, no question. And it's, eight, and it's up 8% on the year, since the beginning of the year. So, So that brings us next to the Australian dollar, because there's an awful lot of speculation now that after the RBNZ cut rates overnight, that the RBA could be next. Now, the RBA has recently cut rates to record lows of 2%. What does that mean for the Aussie dollar? Does that mean that there's more rate cuts on the cards? I think the answer to that is probably yes. Let's look at where the Australian dollars come from since 2007. Or 2008. Basically, we're still well above the levels we saw at the beginning of 2000, at the end of 2008, when we were around about 60 cents. We've broken below the 200-month moving average. We've also broken below the lows that we saw at the beginning of this year, March, March this year, around about 75. So the direction of travel is potentially for a much lower Australian dollar. There is also something else to be concerned about with respect to the Aussie dollar, and it's Australia's over-reliance on commodities, particularly gold, copper, iron ore. Rio Tinto and BHP are basically key exporters to China. And Australia is a key, you know, China is a key market for Australia. Coal prices are also low. And when you actually look at the economic numbers for Australia, 55% of Australia's exports are 
um, basically commodity-based, commodity-driven. Think of what's happened to commodity prices over the last 12 months. In fact, think of what's happened to commodity prices over the last five years. You've only got to look at um, the Bloomberg Commodities Index or the Reuters CRB Index to know that foreign, foreign currency earnings for Australian companies have taken a huge hit over the course of that time, which means that essentially Australia's trade balance is probably going to continue to deteriorate, which means that that 20 years of uninterrupted GDP growth that we've seen out of Australia, 25 years now, could be at risk. That being said, the Australian economy is still growing at 2%, but you have to be aware that further interest rate cuts in Australia will fuel a housing bubble that's already out of control around Melbourne and Sydney. So it's going to be very interesting times for Australia unless they can rebalance their economy away from commodities because the demand that we've seen out of China in the first 15 years of this century is not going to be anywhere near as ferocious as, uh, as it was. And that is going to have consequences for the Australian economy, which means we're probably going to see a lower Australian dollar particularly if the RBA cuts rates and people continue to speculate that the Fed will raise. I'm still sceptical that the Fed will raise, but we may get a hike in December, but I don't think we'll get one in September. Colin, anything to add? Um, yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm basically of the mind with you that I still think the Fed's going to sneak one uh, one interest rate in uh, a raise this year, uh, most likely in December, just like they did with tapering. They kind of just yeah. got it in before the end of the year. I mean, a lot of the Fed members are still talking about wanting to uh, wanting to do it this year. Even uh, even uh, Dr. Yellen, who uh, mentioned it in her uh, in her testimony uh, mm. recently, and, and and for them, I think it's just a matter of uh, that the. Um, that it's going to, they, they need to start doing something. They can't stay at zero forever. And uh, and they've, they, the other thing they've talked about is that they're planning on doing it pretty slow. So it's not like in the in the past where uh, where Greenspan, I think he raised in the last time raised interest rates a quarter point at 14 consecutive meetings. It's not going to be like that this time. They'll probably do an increase and then wait a couple of meetings and then do another one, and and that sort of thing. They seem to be really big this time on uh, on keeping the pace of increases slow. Kind of a recognition that they need to start going up, but that they don't want to go up go up very fast or, or, or very aggressively. So I think that they're uh, they're mindful that they need to get off of zero, but at the same time that they don't want to uh, want to crush their economy either. For That's an what it strikes me. They, it feels like they, they want to do it, and they really want to do it. Yeah. But they box themselves into a corner, because when you look at what's happening to commodity prices, you look at what's happening everywhere yeah. else. Everyone else is cutting rates. Yeah, the truth is the Fed's waited too long again. Yeah. They probably, they really should have, uh, they should have, as soon as tapering finished last fall, they should have just, just done it, I mean, you know, really. And and at the same time, I always find it an interesting one. I mean, we talk about, you know, 0.25 uh, interest rates, but, but but who's actually paying that? I mean, here we've got 0.5% interest rates, but all the, the mortgage rate is more like 3, the line of credit rate is more like 5, and the, uh, we won't, you know, we won't even get into what some of the credit cards start charging, right? No, oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's the same over here. I mean, personal loan over here is eight yeah. percent, you know, and yet base rates are at half a percent. Yeah. So, so you know, you know benchmark... I mean, even if they raise a quarter of a point, is that going to have an impact on consumers? I doubt it. I doubt it, but it probably will have an impact in terms of benchmarks, in terms of how um, mortgage rates are priced, because they're priced off LIBOR or they're priced off base. So it's yeah. going to affect trackers. Um, but um, you, you know you, you are right. I mean, basically, if you look at you look at rates in the U.S. and you look at the rates in the U.K. and the exchange rate itself acts as a form of monetary tightening. Absolutely, and you could say, I mean, the huge, uh, the huge. Then that, that's another point, right? Absolutely, it's true that uh, that the big gains that the U.S. dollar has made over the last year is certainly the equivalent of several uh, several rate hikes. I mean, I've been saying the. the the uh, the opposite about Canada that the uh, that the way the loonies come down in the last two months is a huge uh, is a huge easing, mm. and then and here too we're talking about rebalancing the economy where the uh, the oil price crash that took Alberta down with it 
and uh, and so you've got this Canadian growth has been knocked back to zero, and uh, and now you're talking now you've got a rebalance. But the problem is the rebalancing on the the export side and the tourism and the the people don't go on the U.S. shopping trips anymore, and uh, and and the, the the movie industry comes back and and, and stuff like that is uh, it, that all takes longer to kick in, right? So you get this mm. short term negative, long term positive. And uh, and and the U.S. is probably seeing the reverse of that, where you get some short-term positive effects, and now you're seeing the longer-term negatives on on the earnings of people like Apple and the other multinationals is starting to work its way in. Mm. All right, we've managed to get through this half an hour, and we haven't even mentioned Greece once. Amazing, um, <laughs> which, which, which is absolutely incredible. So let's move on to the euro. All right, um, because the euro does appear to be finding a little bit of a base. Yes, it does. Around it's been one, acting uh, pretty good the last day or two. Uh, around 108. Um, it's had two attempts at it since it peaked at 114.5 in May. And it's basically failed on both occasions. So that also begs the question is how much further upside is there in the dollar? Now, if, if, I, look at this, if I look at this chart here, which is a daily chart for euro dollar, um, that suggests to me that um, potentially we could actually track higher through 110, we had a little look at it at 110 earlier today, through 110, and retest the highs that we saw earlier this month around about 112. I think if at any point we break below 108, then obviously we can definitely, we, we can probably move lower. But at the moment, the euro dollar trade is what I would call a classic pain trade, because everyone wants it and thinks it will go lower. And I'm not overly convinced that it will. So you generally will find that every time the market tries to push it lower, you'll get a nice little short squeeze. They'll, all the shorts will get taken out. And um, while it may eventually go lower, it'll probably go higher first. But the big, big level is around about 115. This is a very bullish daily reversal candle here mm -hmm. on the Tuesday. I think as long as we can hold above around about 109.20.30, then we could well push higher back towards 111 and 112. So that suggests to me the dollar could weaken. And I'm seeing a similar sort of story played out. Oh, before you leave that, Michael, can I say one thing to that? Yeah, you can. It, that's a very, very strong base. If you look at this, you've got a double bottom in March and April. Now you've essentially got a double bottom at a higher level here between May and uh, and July. That's a that's a really, really strong uh, accumulation pattern there with with two re, two support retests kicking it at a higher level. On top of that, you, you're oversold on the stochastics, so you're, it looks like there you're you're already oversold. Uh, uh, sorry, overextended to the downs. I mean, it's certainly looking pretty good here. And this is when the when the the Grexit fears were growing. The uh, the euro was bottoming out. It tells me that the euro already had priced it in back in uh, back in the spring, and that uh, that this is a, this is a starting to shape up as a really nice turnaround here. And you're right also that the, the sentiment's still very negative on this. There's and and finally the the short euro trade short. Uh, the, euro dollar trade has been very crowded. So there's a uh, potential for a, a lot of uh, potential for buying to come back in as people have to cover that. So that's just do that there. So basically I'm keeping an eye on this trend line here from the June highs. So keep an eye on, keep an eye on this level, ladies and gents, because this could be crucial in the context of where we go next. Looking a little bit overbought at the moment on the four-hour chart, which is what this one is, but overall I'd be looking for a test of this line here mm -hmm. and then see how we react, then see how we react around there. And I think it's a similar sort of story on the pound against the dollar. Um, pound has been marginally a little bit stronger, but again, you know, we're finding it's settling down into a little bit of a sideways range. This is a four hour chart here. Um, 156.75 is the big, big level on the top side. It was last week's highs. It's also been this week's highs, but again, we've got good support around about 155.20. But below that, we've also got a much longer term trend line from the lows in May and we also have the 200 day moving average. That being said, there's probably more potential for a little bit of a drift lower than higher. Now that, that probably means that Euro Sterling could actually squeeze higher and Euro Sterling does have a tendency to do precisely that. 
Um, just when you think that euro sterling is is going to go down quite aggressively, suddenly it ratchets higher, takes out all the shorts, and then goes lower. So at the moment, I think, and while we're below 156.75 on cable, you've got to be a little bit you've got to be a little bit worried about um, another test lower before we break out. But overall, I still think cable can go higher, um, just on the basis of the fact that um, when when the Fed does get around to hiking, I don't think the Bank of England will be too far behind. Agreed, and I think we saw that in the in the speculation this week. The uh, you know the first round, the uh, the MPC minutes come out, and and people are starting to think about inflation. And boom, up goes sterling, and then and then and then of course we had the retail uh, sales come out this morning, and they missed, and then bang back down goes sterling. But it seems one of those where people are are looking for a reason to to speculate on uh, on on rate hikes. It's it's kind of mm-hmm. like what we've seen the the flip side of the of the earnings, where the earnings are coming out, and people are looking for reasons to sell. It looks to me as though People are looking for reasons to uh, to go uh, to go long on this, or to and looking for reasons to uh, to think that uh, that uh, liftoff could be coming to the UK as well. Yeah, I don't think it'll be happening overnight. I mean, basically, no, I no. think um, in the August meeting will be interesting in the context of what Martin Wheel and Ian McCafferty do, because mm-hmm. this time last year they dissented and were calling for rate hikes. Um, from the Bank of England around about this time last year. They changed their votes at the beginning of this year to go along with the consensus. Mm -hmm. But given some of their recent comments, there is a good chance that we could go for another 7-2 split in terms of unchanged and a 25 basis point rate hike. What that doesn't mean, however, is that we're in danger of putting rates up in the short to medium term because we were 7-2 for about the last three or four months of last year and rates never went up. So mm-hmm. dissent is nothing new. If we get dissent, we may get a little bit of a spike higher in the pound against the dollar. But with numbers with respect to 7.2, that's not going to move the dial in the context of timing. Right, which I, I believe the last uh, talk was still the middle of 2016? Yeah, or the beginning. Certainly yeah. the beginning at the earliest. Yeah, I wonder if they'd have to go for the beginning with the with the risk of a uh, of a Brexit referendum later. When, when would that be later in the year? 2017. Okay. It's not going to happen before then. I'll be surprised if it does. Which brings me to euro sterling, which is the daily chart. And again, here we're getting the oscillator starting to turn upwards. We've got two very strong upward candles in the past three days, which does seem to suggest the market is a little bit short. Mm-hmm. Um, but overall, um, this looks to me like another just another uh, uh, trading bounce within a, within a broader downtrend so far. Because I mean, you're still yeah. on the channel of lower highs and lower lows, and you're just we, you know you, you had an oversold, you you got an oversold, and you're bouncing here. Yeah. But I think you'd you'd have to at a minimum clear that previous high, which I can't read very well, but that seventy two twenty. Yeah, you'd have to take that out before we could think that it's anything more than just another dead cat bounce. Mm. Yeah, as I say, I mean, we've made marginal new lows around about 69.30, mm. um, which coincides with the lows that we saw at the end of 2007, going all the way really? back here. Oh, yeah. So this November 2007, I think, was... Uh, where are we? Let's just do this. Yeah, November 2007 low was 69.20. So that was that was a fairly key support level there before we basically went higher. That's held so far. So as I say, we could go all the way back to 72 on this particular short squeeze without undermining the bearish scenario too much. Now let's look at the dolly yen because this this chart here that looks like a bearish engulfing day. Mm-hmm. Um, and also 124, 50, 60, and these series of peaks here does seem to suggest there is natural interest to sell. Given what Kuroda said, Bank of Japan Governor Kuroda said earlier this week, has he called a short-term top in dollar yen? It's going to take something quite significant to push it through 124 and a half. So while we're below 124 and a half, there is potential for us to drift back down again towards the top of the Ichimoku cloud which is around about 123.20, 123.30.
Do you anything you want to add there, Colin? Uh, no, I mean it just looks like again it's gotten overbought and rolling over, and uh, and so I wouldn't be surprised at all to see it come back off within this uh, within this channel here. But that that 124 and change is definitely looking like a pretty strong. Uh, Strong resistance level, or, or up to 125, because even if we go back towards that uh, that one uh, one day up uh, peak uh, above 125, there we were. We look at the prior high there was about 125. So 124.60, 125 looks like it's emerging as a uh, as a pretty uh, significant resistance zone. Even in just uh, taking out that uh, that one day wonder there as a, a as a one time thing. Yeah, and the, also, the other uh, days are all kicking in pretty hard. And I mean, when you look at the one day it popped up and then bang, went, went right back down, it's also telling you that that was a uh, was a false a head fake. And the fact that you said it earlier, when a weekly jobless claims number as good as the one that we just got doesn't precipitate a significant rally in dollar yen, then you have to ask yourself what will. Absolutely. So caution is the watchword with respect to the long dollar strategy, I think, at these sorts of levels. Um, right, ladies and gentlemen, we're running, we're pushing the boundaries of time here. We've been going 45 minutes. We're going to wrap this up. But before we do, is there anything that any of you would like either Colin or myself to look at right now? Um, please use the chat facility to basically address your questions. Otherwise, we'll wind this up. We'll post it online, and it will be available on YouTube. Right, being asked the S&P 500. Let's have a quick look at that. We're range-bound in that, I think. That's a very strong bearish candle there. Um, it's actually fairly similar to the Apple chart, isn't it? Um, good resistance. To, to be quite honest, I think we're range-bound on the S&P. The oscillator is starting to turn over a little bit. We could probably go back to 2130. But overall, I think the, the direction of travel here, Colin, for me, is for us to drift back down again. Yeah, I think we're sideways to uh, to lower within the sideways channel. Could you bring that out to a uh, a one-year chart, please, Michael? Or at least back to the beginning of the year. There, you go. there that's perfect. So we're in the sideways trading range for the uh, for the uh, S and P, uh, and it's similar to ranges we've seen before uh, around the time that the Fed was starting to. Uh, starting to move towards tightening. You get a case where the liquidity kind of dries up that was pushing the market higher, but at the same time, so that caps your upside. Your downside gets limited by the fact that, that corporate earnings are, are generally going okay because the economy is improving and you get stuck. So we saw this in 94.95. We saw it in 04.05, and we're getting it again here in, uh, in, in 15, where we're into a sideways pattern for U.S. markets that can drag on for nine months to a year. So if you measure nine months off February or if you say, well, maybe this started kind of started back in November you measure a year off November puts you into October November we're still kind of in the middle innings of this and uh, and I think that with the uh, with the historical seasonality of the fact that August and September are usually not very good months for stock markets through to about mid-October that uh, that I think we're probably going to see this chair its way sideways for quite a while we've bumped up against the top so it wouldn't surprise me at all to retest the uh, the low end of that channel in the coming weeks I think a lot will depend, obviously, also on next week's FOMC meeting. Absolutely. Um, got, got a Fed meeting next week. Um, not expecting any change, but I think what we will be looking for is any sort of signposting as to what the Fed may want to be doing when it reconvenes in September. Mm -hmm. So look at the statement language for any clues as to, you know, what the policy, what policymakers are thinking with respect to the U.S. economy. Um, and, and the and the direction of and the strength of the dollar, more importantly. Yes, and I think the markets come in pretty solidly uh, behind pricing in a uh, a September increase. So if you see the move towards that, the U.S. dollar maybe might go up a little bit, but not a lot. But I think the surprise might be to the markets would be if they start to back away from September. That's where you could uh, you could see some movement or action in the dollar. So next Wednesday, keep an eye on that, ladies and gents. It could actually be a significant dollar mover. Right, on that note, um, Colin and I would like to thank you for your uh, time today. And um, until uh, next Monday's webinar with my colleague Jasper, the next non-farm payrolls webinar with myself and Colin. Both Colin and myself would like to thank you for your time today, and uh, we'll talk to you very, very soon.